So just take it easy. Um, Just checking if we are live. Okay, I think we are live. Are uh, you guys ready? Hello and welcome to Conversations in Ideas. And I'm Awal Kasim Alo moderating today's discussion on decolonizing knowledge systems, specifically decolonizing Ethiopian studies. Post-colonial scholars have been observing that the knowledge is conceptual categories, analytic frameworks, values, ideas that govern our world are unthinkingly Eurocentric. Uh, ideas of central political importance, such as sovereignty, autonomy, secularism, humanism, uh, human rights, uh, free markets, freedom of contract, or for example, the distinction between the private and public, all of these things that predominantly inform the ways in which we do politics are predominantly European forms of conceptualizations with their own uniquely European theology. What that means is that Europe is still the silent referent of historical knowledge and also of scientific knowledge. And more recently, there have been a concerted pushback against this epistemological hegemony of Europe with movements within universities and across institutions calling for decolonizing education, including in places like Cambridge, LSE, and other institutions. There has been similar movement in, Af in Africa, particularly uh, in South Africa. So what does it mean to decolonize knowledge? And what are some of the concerns, the problems, and issues uh, around the coloniality of knowledge? And how do we go about doing that? And how does this idea of decolonizing knowledge translates into local knowledge systems, specifically, for example, uh, the idea of decolonizing uh, Ethiopian studies. And to what extent is Ethiopian studies Ethiopian in terms of embracing the various ideas and views that, that exist uh, within the Ethiopian state? So to discuss this and a number of other issues, I am joined by uh, two um, individuals. Um, one is uh, from Melbourne, uh, Heile Gabriel Friesa. He is a PhD candidate uh, at the Asian Law Center at uh, Melbourne Law School. Uh, his research interests include comparative law, legal history, and legal affairs in Ethiopia and beyond. Uh, another um, speaker who joined us is uh, Dr. Abadir Ibrahim. Dr. Abadir is a human rights scholar, uh, he's an international scholar, uh, currently an independent researcher and consultant based uh, in Chicago. Uh, both of these individuals have written on this particular question, uh, specifically in response to a recent article uh, published on uh, Anti Standard. We'll talk more specifically uh, in the second half of this conversation. Uh, but, both, thank you very much for uh, taking your time and joining me uh, on this program. Thank you for, for your invitation. Um, so, wow. So as I said, um, I want to start broadly at the broader sort of global level. Um, why is this a significant topic? Why is this a significant debate uh, today? Uh, Haile Gabriel, can I start with you? Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity again, Awal. Um, why is it a, a significant topic today? Well, for, for, for different reasons, I think. Uh, to start with, as you have mentioned earlier, uh, the knowledge systems that we have right now, uh, even those that we, we, we adopted in Ethiopia, uh, uh, are Eurocentric, uh, Eurocentric at various levels. Uh, Eurocentric, for instance, uh, in terms of the thought structures, uh, Eurocentric uh, in terms of uh, the issues or the focuses of, uh, you know, the researches that we do. Uh, Eurocentric in terms of, you know, the 
the world views that they legitimize and uh, so on. Uh, so for, for, for this reason, and uh, on another level, again, uh, uh, for, for, for their role in the domination of uh, non-European uh, communities or peoples in periphery parts of the world, mm -hmm. which it is one. Uh, uh, can also be uh, mentioned as a reason. And after what we call decolonization uh, in Africa and other parts of the world, uh, this policy systems, their continuity uh, may be taken as, you know, as, uh, as a continuation of, you know, uh, what, what is supposed to be, you know, uh, ended with uh, decolonization in the 1960s or so. Uh, for this and uh, other multiple reasons, uh, it is topical and uh, discussing it would be, uh, I think, uh, one way of, you know, uh, uh, addressing the issue. Uh, mm. Right. Um, so qu quite a number of issues there, uh, Abader. Um, one, I think, very important point that he pointed out is that if the cultures and ideas and, and uh, identities that were represented in the global orders of knowledge are so specific, uh, then what that does is marginalize and exclude uh, people who are on the peripheries of those uh, at the center of those at the core. Uh, we'll come back to this and, and pick up on, this, on these issues. Uh, can you say a little bit more in terms of your own discipline, what some of the problems are? Yes, so, um, you know, the reason I'm interested in, the reason um, I was so interested in Hewan's uh, publication um, was because, you know, this is something I have to deal with pretty much Reg, you know, regularly, pretty much on a daily basis, you could even say. Um, you know, Haile Gabriel was talking about the, the you know, the st uh, structure of knowledge, um, but not only the structure of knowledge, it, you know, I have to, uh, I, I guess we have to, and I, Awal and I have talk, talked about this uh, a number of times, we have to deal with the legal structure, the cultural structure, the societal structure, you know, globally, where um, us as human rights attorneys and human rights scholars um, have to, have to uh, mediate these structures and how they affect us and our communities. Um, so when, when we're working in, you know, constitutionalism and human rights, we have this problem of, on the one hand, as scholars, as activists, we actually are um, functioning as agents of diffusion of Western uh, legal structures, of Western cultural norms and mores. Um, and, and we do these things for a reason. You know, we, we are compelled to do these things, A, because they, they are already in our structures, they're already in Ethiopian and African um, culture and constitutional structures, and we have to deal with them. And at the same time, we feel that we don't have a choice but to do that, because the alternative would be to let, you know, the Ethiopian dictatorship uh, do as it may. So, that, you know, one of the tools we have appropriated in the process of fighting uh, injustice and inequality are these Western structures and notions. So as, as in one sense, we're working as agents of um, at least diffusion of, you know, uh, Western culture. At the same time, however, we're also working, we're actively working as um, agents of anti-colonialism. So um, the reason I was interested is because um, in Ethiopia, I, I was, um, maybe we'll talk about this later, I was pointed, out, I was pointed to a couple of, um, you know, meta-narrative -pub publications on Ethiopia, but the reason I was interested is because I don't have a 
generic tool I can use, a conceptual tool I can use to navigate these things. Um, I have to deal with these things on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and that's why I'm interested, interested in this topic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it specifically affects what I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to come back to this point and specifically talk about the ways in which international law and human rights uh, provides us with certain normative frameworks, ethical languages, uh, to articulate our grievances and our suffering against certain forms of power, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, um, disseminates other forms of power, right, which uh, would in some ways establish Western uh, worldview, Western ways of life as universal. Um, but the problem is not so much that uh, Europe and European thinkers are too Eurocentric, and I don't think that is a problem. Um, but the problem has to do with a certain insistence uh, that has the aim of establishing uh, Western ways of being and acting as universal maxims for all people and all nations, which is extremely problematic, even in terms of these ideas of equality, dignity, uh, autonomy, and so on uh, and so forth. Um, earlier, uh, Gabriel, you were talking about this notion of uh, how European forms of knowledge is those forms of conceptualizations are somewhat universal, are valid for all people and all nations across time and space. Yeah. But other forms of law religious are sort of considered as regional, provincial. Yeah. In your view, what, what is the impact of that in, in terms of, I suppose, in a range of areas, in terms of uh, political visibility, uh, economic, um, economic achievements, and so on and so forth? Um, yeah. Uh... Uh, if I approach the problem with uh, with uh, the research that I'm right now engaged with, yeah, and this uh, would be my answer. Uh, what would be the problem? Uh, um, well, uh, to start with, uh, this notion of universality uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, offers only the European, uh, well, when we, when we first talk about, you know, this European or West, again, we kind of have, you know, have to qualify it because uh, it assumes that Europe as a concept or, you know, is a Europe as a reality is, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, uh, holistic and uh, without, you know, its own uh, specificities and uh, pluralities. Mm -hmm. That is not the case. But, but again, you know, uh, the idea that that Europe, the developed Europe, uh, the, 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 the transcendental Europe or the, the, uh, the civilized Europe uh, mm -hmm. is within, you know, our uh, thought systems. And uh, that is, for instance, can be manifested in different uh, uh, ways. For instance, uh, when you look at you know uh, how Ethiopian laws are studied, particularly those imported laws, those from the Western countries, mm -hmm. uh, they are often approached with you know uh, with uh, decided that these laws are first of all. Uh, there as a means of you know civilizing that society and again second the way they the way they should be studied is that uh, in such a way that their effectiveness is you know measured against you know such and uh, set standards and if you look at you know those standards uh, they are often based on you know values which are you know dominant or hegemonic in europe and uh, the indicators are the indicators of you know this uh, values are uh, again uh, well they are contested but again you know they are given this uh, universal appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, all all this you know the focus you know on, on all this the, 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 like uh, framing placing uh, Europe as uh, the universal uh, 
testing and uh, measuring ourselves or measuring, you know, whatever we do uh, in terms of that uh, would deny, you know, uh, the the appreciation of, you know, the different stories that that are, you know, uh, experienced in real uh, in real terms in on the ground mm-hmm. and this. Uh, you know, uh, invisibilizes the different uh, aspects of, you know, uh, experiencing modernity or what have you in Ethiopia or in other parts of the world. Mm. So uh, these are one of the real effects of invisibilizing, you know, uh, mm. Mm. experiences of uh, marginalized people with, with experiences of, you know, colonialism or imperialism. Uh, Invisibilizing their resistance, uh, invisibilizing uh, uh, their contests. Uh, contests at different level, mm-hmm. and invisibilization of you know the different temporalities and uh, the spatial uh, uh, dynamics that may involve you know those imported laws. Mm-hmm. So this can be taken as you know one of them. Some of you know. Uh, the consequences of, you know, uh, uh, Eurocentrism or... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, no, no absolutely. Yeah, before, before you move on, can I add something? I know, uh, you know, uh, you're the moderator. I'm, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not actually moving on. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. If, if it is something that you want to add to that, uh, that's fine. Yeah, it is, it is. But if you're adding, I'll, I'll wait. So yeah, no, no, I, I was just going to say that I think the, the issue that he talked about in terms of the effects that these Eurocentric forms of knowledge has in invisibilizing and, and uh, marginalizing certain ways of being and acting in the world, it just really highlights how Europe has been the sort of geographical, political, and uh, conceptual epicenter of pretty much everything that we use. Right? If, I am, if I am in pain, if I am in agony, oppressed and marginalized, the language that I use to capture, apprehend, and, and, and convey that to uh, another party is European language. That is, that is sort of the, the domain of knowledge uh, that I turn to in, in terms of doing that. What we are saying here is that this is problematic at so many levels, right? Insofar as we have this highly interconnected world, we are related in so many different ways. And sometimes we sort of litigate and adjudicate disputes. And when we do so, we use languages, we use these ideas, right? Uh, not, not just in law, but also broadly in international diplomacy and politics and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, so, so that has a rather serious implication in terms of maintaining the kind of inequality and relationship of domination that, that exists uh, around the world. Um, so about it, you know, the, the language that Herr Gabriel uses is slightly different. He talks about temporalities, um, uh, specialities, mm-hmm. specific to sort of uh, the intellectual tradition uh, that he belongs to. Um, you are an international legal scholar. Um, an international, there are so many concepts that we kind of throw around. Um, you know, we talk about uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms, we talk about free trade, we talk about fight against humanity, responsibility to protect, uh, protecting the environment, um, a range of other uh, constellations and frameworks uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of tools that are available to govern. Um, one of the problems that I see with this is that because these are usually shows that are run right in a language that are either European or American, uh, and dominated by people from European and American think tanks and, and, and academic institutions. When they talk, the rest of us will just shut up and listen. Right? And, and that has been one of the central problems. And you know, while, as you said, on the one hand, there is, there is something good about having these resources, but at the same time, we have this utter inequality imbalance in terms of how this is at the deepest level uh, distributed. How do you think we sort of deal with this? How, how do we use the good things about it, but at the same time sort of reject and critique the problems that come with it? Um, well, I mean, I, I will not pretend I have an answer to that question. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I suppose partly 
um, this pursuit, the reason why I'm here today is because um, I'm in the process of listening to others um, as to, you know, to engage in a conversation of uh, what we should do. So I'll start with that, you know, uh, annunciation of humility uh, before answering your question. Um, my initial thoughts on how to go about this is, um, and, and this also has to do with our subject position that I was talking about earlier. What mm -hmm. we need to do, I believe, is um, to listen to to like to screen to uh, function as a screen to screen out these discourses, these discourses that we are a part of, to screen them out so that the locals, and, and in, in this term, our locals, get a chance to articulate their uh, grievances and pain in their own languages. So, um, you know, you face this problem in all sorts of ways. Um, you said you picked up environmentalism, for example. You know, the question is, um, yes, we want to, want to protect the environment from the exploitation of, you know, uh, global uh, corporations, which basically are, you know, um, you know, de destroying the environment for their own profit, which Ethiopians don't get to, you know, poor Ethiopians don't, don't get to benefit uh, from. Now, it's, you know, you have this urge to take whatever is available, whatever, you know, intellectual resources available, and use it to protect the environment, thereby protecting, you know, your own locals. Um, so that urge is, is unstoppable. It's not going to go away. So my prescription is to stop and listen because the, lo the it, there are so many localities in Ethiopia and they will have their own uh, language to express their grievances. It's, it's, it might be, for example, related to uh, economic exploitation. It might be related to uh, identity, for example, or sexuality. That's that's one one good example, by the way. You, for example, you uh, want to protect e LGBTI people, if we can call them that, in Ethiopia. And if you take up the Western notions of LGBTI rights and impose them in Ethiopia, um, you're basically reinforcing. You know, even when you're doing it to protect people, you're reinforcing uh, the hegemonic um, structure of knowledge. So my proposal would be, why don't we listen to individuals coming from Ethiopia, whether they're talking about um, but it try and take those nuggets. I'm, am I still there? You you are stuck, uh, but we do hear you. Uh, can, can you hear me? How about it? Okay, um, I will bring in about it a little later. Um, but we will continue. Uh, if, if you can hear me about Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, your your connection is very bad. We can't hear you very well, and your image is also uh, stuck. Um, so if you could if you could actually exit and come back. Okay, I'm going to remove him. Uh, hopefully, he will uh, come back and join us. Um, he's still there <laughs> for some reason. I couldn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Am I back? Are. All right. There we are. Uh, I was trying to remove you from uh, from the system, but uh, <laughs> I couldn't even do that because your your picture was uh, stuck on the screen. Um, okay. Would you like to continue? Oh uh, yes. Yeah. So so basically, my uh, proposal, my Tentative proposal, at least the, the way I'm looking at things, is to say, um, 
let's let's listen to our own people I, I'm, you know they will have their own way of articulating these things and it's you know i'm not necessarily always opposed to borrowing ideas from western discourses um it's just that you know if we listen to this local discourses we actually have them in ethiopia and and um, and this is connected with what Haile Gabriel was saying earlier about um, the study of law in Ethiopia. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think the problem is actually only about the study of law. It's actually what law is, how law is defined. You know, we come from a tradition where, you know, in Ethiopia, there are so many legal systems. You know, in Ethiopia, at the same time, you have I mean, let's say you have, you know, 80 different cultural groups, right? In, out of those 80 cultural groups, maybe there are 40 uh, different legal systems, uh, including, you know, the, uh, uh, for example, the church that probably still employs the Fatanagast and things like that. And, and we have uh, swaths of Ethiopia applying uh, Muslim and traditional forms of uh, legal systems in Ethiopia. These things are coexisting with the West. So, you know, take the civil code or commercial code. You live at Addis Ababa in a couple of cities. Those things don't exist at all. Mm. And in Ethiopia, we study, we spend all our resources studying these um, imported laws. You know, I'm not saying they're not important. They have their own uh, role to play. But our thinking is so slanted that we don't even consider the other local laws as laws at all. So, so your point in, in terms of the ways in which Ethiopian law is uh, transplanted from other jurisdictions is that the, the, the process of translating the norms is not appropriately done. And no, what I'm saying is the, the transplanted law that we have is only one of maybe 40 other different legal systems in Ethiopia. So, so in, terms of, in terms of that which we have transplanted, yes. what is your concern? Is your point that, no, we have adequate legal systems, we don't need them? Or no, 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 no. no. Not, I mean, you know, um, that's not what I'm saying. So the, with that legal system, with the transplanted legal system, there's the problem that uh, Haile Gabriel was uh, addressing earlier. What I'm saying is that narrow view of law as the transplanted legal system itself is uh, Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we are like, the, we are the, by the way, and this is a difficult position to be in, we are the westernized individuals who are actually promoting we're, you know, 60 years ago, these things were transplanted. Mm. We are today promoting the entrenchment of these laws mm. into the rest of Ethiopia. The rest of Ethiopia, 80% is, you know, rural. Maybe out of the, that 80%, I'm, you know, just throwing out numbers here. Maybe 40% of Ethiopia is unaffected by um, the civil code, for example. But when we define law, Ethiopian law, as... This, when we define the civil code as Ethiopian law, we are in a way reinforcing, entrenching the civil code, as opposed to saying, you know, let's stand back and let's see if we can let local legal systems, you know, harbor themselves and grow out into, into something else. So we are actually actively <clears throat> pushing the, the local legal systems into the margins and promoting these transplanted laws. Mm. So that's what you know, um, makes our position really difficult. Right. I, I think there are a range of uh, doctrinal and jurisprudential questions that, that require uh, a lawyer to start from somewhere, right? Mm. Uh, mm. And um, proceed according to certain hierarchies that are, that are recognized by the kind of superior legislation in the country, be that the constitution or something else. So law, in fact, is, is a highly uh, Eurocentric, uh, perhaps the most constraining, the most rigid uh, 
uh, sort of black letter discipline, um, um, yeah. which, which doesn't yeah, allow. Okay. Uh, a lot. Uh, adding to the. Uh, about this point. Yeah, about this point about, you know, how to decolonize uh, or about, you know, uh, strategies of decolonization. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from, you know, uh, empowering uh, people to articulate their grievances in terms of, you know, their own language or what have you. Uh, to the extent that the language we in the academic world that uh, use are still, you know, uh, essentially, you know, Eurocentric, uh, the following uh, points or the, the following, you know, uh, strategies uh, can also be offered, I think. One is uh, Acknowledging the entanglement of you know knowledge systems with uh, power or imperialism, this imperialism uh, is not necessarily that of only of European origin. Mm -hmm. It can be of you know local imperialism as well. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from acknowledging you know all I think you know showing the partiality and limitation of our language or knowledge system in theorizing our existence in this order, re rejecting, you know, the universalism of, you know, hegemonic values. Uh, um, okay. So, so uh, let me, let me just uh, interject there because I think you are throwing uh, out some very useful points. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the points you made is acknowledging and recognizing this inherent entanglement of knowledge with questions of power, specifically questions yes. of domination and equality and so on. So. No yes. system of domination, no system of inequality can properly establish itself and function without using or making use of certain forms of knowledge, right? Yep. So discourse plays a very important role. And in fact, one of my favorites, uh, uh, Tinker Michel Foucault says that it is within discourse that power and knowledge articulate one another, right? Yep. So, so basically every discourse is a function of both power and certain forms of knowledge. Powers actually yeah. cannot take off the ground without certain ideas that makes it legitimate. Yeah. You can think about uh, a number of ways through which power is legitimized in the Ethiopian context when we come to uh, Ethiopia. And, and I think and a recognizing understanding that is absolutely important. So I think the question is not that a particular form of knowledge can always be oppressive, right? Yeah. And knowledge can be used in a lot of different ways. But of course. Since it functions in tandem with certain forms of power, yeah. the ways in which it generates particular forms of effect depends on how that particular power uses it. And the extent to which that discourse and knowledge is available to various group of people who want to use it and advance particular goals. So I think I just wanted to sort of uh, um, yeah. emphasize that important point that, uh, that you made. The other, I think, important point you made is how um, these forms of power um, that, that appropriate different forms of knowledge um, are not necessarily European, can also be local forms of hegemonic powers, local yeah. forms of uh, imperialisms. So it's not specifically a Europe thing. It can exist in any form of relations at the state level and also at sub-state level. Now, there's something else I think that, that you talked about, which is the the impartiality of language itself. Yeah. Right? The fact that the language that we use um, does not simply d describe something, but it also sort of constitutes something. It creates, uh, it creates something that it is not neutral. My question here is, um, to what extent, for example, the, the knowledges that we have, let's say in Ethiopia, um, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, dispute settlement at the local level or um, are different. To what extent are those capable of adequately expressing some of the complex experiences that we encounter on a daily basis in modern life? Mm. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, and my take on that would be, you know, uh, a bit sceptical one. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, I don't think uh, our scholarship uh, is that much reflective and uh, so much engaged with, you know, uh, the scholarship that uh, we see emerging in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. When I say different parts of the world, the non-European world, uh, where we're seeing you know, this uh, decolonial thinking uh, taking uh, root. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, it comes, you know, with this this uh, reflective scholarship that uh, that you know uh, our our capacity to articulate you know or uh, understand our existence uh, uh, impert I would say depends on you know our continued reflective engagement with uh, whatever resources whether both you know local mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. But that kind of scholarship, I would say, is missing in Ethiopia. And that can be explained in terms of uh, different factors. One being, you know, the uh, low level of, you know, intellectualism and uh, the authoritarian nature of, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. No, um, no, no I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question on, on, on this point. Uh, so Hal Gabriel was saying that how the language that we use as, as academics and scholars uh, of Ethiopian origin uh, largely draws on uh, European ideas, on European languages. And in fact, even in, in, in times uh, and occasions when we engage uh, with political issues, social issues, um, um, even in, in, in local languages, in Amharic or in, in Afan Oromo, we struggle, right, to, to, to understand and, I mean, we understand, but to sort of articulate uh, that problem uh, in that language without throwing in a lot of English words, English vocabularies. And most people would think, why on earth are these people using this language? But if you are actually someone that is engaged in the process of thinking and producing knowledge, um, you simply can't help it because in some cases there are no equivalent local languages, right, to capture uh, and apprehend that problem that you are, you are dealing with. Um, but this is not a problem that is limited to academics and scholars. So, for example, if you think about, about it, this is for you, if you think about the ways in which you know, the language of freedom and democracy and autonomy and liberty, dignity, the ways in which this language are uncritically used by, by activists, um, uh, uh, various civil society groups uh, in Ethiopia, uh, you will see that the, the problem is not limited to, to scholars. It is somewhat pervasive. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you make of that? The, the, the fact that well, this went beyond being dominant in academic circles to, um, to pretty much I suppose, other levels uh, in the civil service and various institutions. Um, what does that say? I, I suppose my question is, what does that say about your previous point, which is that there are these um, uh, original Ethiopian um, local languages and ideas um, that can be used to deal with these problems. Well, what does the fact that pretty much everyone seems to use the language of freedom and democracy? Yeah. What does that say? Um, well, you know, there's something at the core of your question, which is um, the inevitability of the current power structure. And, in, you know, and in some ways it is. You know, inevitable because you know we have this global and you know international order uh, of power and knowledge and it would not be reasonable to say yeah let's let's deconstruct everything and start from scratch it's we are in, 
we would not even be capable of doing that. As you said, not only us, um, but the, the, the activists who, you know, who we disagree with, who um, you mentioned earlier, even they would not be able to disentangle themselves from this structure of power and knowledge. Um, so one of the ways maybe to appropriate, to reappropriate these things and, and use them, and this has happened. This has happened in the anti-colonial struggles where, and this is part of um, the reason why, uh, you know, I become ambivalent about, um, or, or I support the, the discourse of human rights and constitutionalism and freedom, is because these things have in part been uh, appropriated by the anti-colonialism movement. So they have to some degree been, been localized and actually used against the power structure. But at the same time, once you do that, that, that power knowledge structure that we are talking about kind of becomes entrenched. So this becomes the language of uh, even resisting colonialism. Can you get out of it? I don't know. And, and this is part, you know, as, as I'll probably repeatedly say, when I come to this conversation, I'm wanting to listen and learn from others too, because my thinking is so limited to what I do. Um, and we have to, you know, as Ethiopians, as Africans, we have to be able to pay for and sponsor uh, studies of, you know, meta studies of what can be done in, in my field and, you know, uh, your respective the fields and so on. So, you know, that's the, the general approach I see things uh, with. Uh, mm -hmm. To specifically address your question, um, one thing we need to do, so in, in your question, there's an assumption that these are the words, these are the languages that um, have to be used. That, uh, you know, the question is, are we listening to what local constructs of these things are? Or are we trying to, um, you know, when we see someone talk about freedom, when we see a, a locally placed person, an Ethiopian from a small town, talking about freedom and getting it totally wrong. Do we try to educate that person? Do we try to fix their wrongness? Or do we actually listen to them because maybe they have something to teach us? And when we're talking about listening, it's more important for me to listen to um, not just these local constructions or appropriations of you know, freedom and human rights, but aren't are there, do we actually know? And by the way, I don't know. I will admit that I don't know. When you said earlier about commercial litigation and uh, the, complex, the complexities of you know, commercial life in Ethiopia be handled with you know, local legal systems, the answer is I don't know. I don't think we have listened and studied those local systems enough. And, and to see if they actually are um, doing the job, you know, freedom, human rights, commercial litigation, and so on and so forth. You know, there is a lack of knowledge. We aren't studying these things in order to, um, to know in order to achieve this purpose. You know, can, I, can, I, can I just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me say one more thing. Um, you know, obviously, you, you are right. That there's this modern Ethiopia. And that the, the, you know, contingencies of modern Ethiopia will definitely not be uh, dealt with. If you go, for example, if you go to the Afar region or Somali region and look at the customs of nomadic, you know, families, it's obvious that you know they have a legal system, they have a thought system that is appropriate for their lives. You can't really say that you know um, you can't really apply those the, the legal system that they have immediately in Addis Ababa and expect it to function. You know there's there's a certain sense of active construction that might that might need to be done. But the answer really is that we don't know. We haven't studied these things. Or, or I'm total and and uh, Haile Gabriel comes, you know, from the legal history uh, field. Maybe he knows 
if there are studies, but as far as I know, there aren't. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I suppose one of the problem in, in terms of uh, uh, desubjugating or resurrecting these local forms of knowledges and, and use them for a wide range of issues is that we live in a world that is so complex and, and interrelated in so many different ways. And we simply don't have the bargaining power to say that these are the norms that should govern our relations with you. Think of, for example, bilateral mm -hmm. investment treaties. So we are all lawyers and we can sort of talk about this and, and can understand each other. Um, as you know, the model bilateral investment treaty treaties are either American or German, right? And most countries essentially modify these two treaties uh, to suit their own particular situation and, and use them. Now, when a German investor is protected by a treaty that is originated in Germany for his investment in Ethiopia or in Rwanda, and the disputes when it arises between a host country and that particular investor is adjudicated by a certain tribunal, most probably based in London or in Germany, then you can imagine how the dispute settlement mechanism is already skewed towards the investor, right? I mean, you know, set aside other questions of power, even at that level. And the question is, if we want to be part of the global, I don't know, political, economic, whatever order, um, then our position simply means that in most cases, we just have to um, accept and um, do the best we can. Because to what extent, for example, can we impose um, a local uh, dispute settlement mechanism uh, on, on this particular investor? In most cases, the investor will simply say, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and probably go somewhere else and invest somewhere else, right? Now, you know, it, it may not be that straightforward, right? There, there might be um, a few things um, for compromise here and there, but even if compromise happens, it happens within the terms of that sort of rational, right, logical instrument, which is a Western instrument. So it's, it's from that point of view that I ask the question of to what extent the languages that we have, the institutions that we have, the mechanisms that we have, adequate, right, in terms of, um, you know, giving us the language, the framework to deal with this, uh, with this kind of problematic. Um, I want to come back to what, what, uh, what Abadir said around you know, the, the need to um, um, try and construct these ideas, these principles, uh, local principles differently. Wouldn't that take us to um, what you, uh, Haile Gabriel, referred to as um, sort of methodological nationalism or a certain romanticization of local cultures and local values? I would say so because, uh, well, to a certain extent, I agree with this temptation to resist, you know, the hegemonic Eurocentric uh, worldviews or thought structures, a counter kind of, you know, uh, locally generated um, thought structures. Uh, that is actually, you know, the point uh, Hewan uh, raised in her article, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not sure if you know we can do that uh, in 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 in, uh, in a strict sense of the term because uh, again uh, in this uh, I I I personally believe that we're uh, living through you know a, a very complex you know world in reality and reality is you know defined. Uh, with, with you know the multiple spaces and you know temporalities that we occupy, and and not you know disentangle you know these multiple uh, spaces we inhabit and you know temporalities we exist in, uh, so that we can in an European system of thought that you know uh, adequately or adequately in, in quotation that adequately captures or articulates, you know, our existence. For, 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 that, for that particular reason, uh, 
I would say that uh, uh, and instead of you know trying um, to come up with uh, uh, a new form of uh, uh, well, uh, for instance, instead of you know uh, reconstituting uh, what what you call you know custom. Uh, with, the, with uh, the modern law uh, to navigate through the already existing multiple worlds and uh, trying to maximize your uh, 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 would would be uh, <clears throat> strategy uh, an idle uh, I mean a workable strategy for decolonization I would say. Uh, mm. Uh, may, may I say something about yeah. this, guys? So, yeah. um, and, and by the way, as um, I, I'll say again that I'm interested in this conversation because I want to listen. I I actually feel that we need, um, and this is this is uh, really important in terms of this conversation is not taking place. This conversation is taking place. Um, and, and really at smaller circles, and we need to have this conversation on, on a wider range in, among Ethiopian um, academics and non-academics. Um, so yes, one of the options is to take what we have, um, including what we have from the West, and work with it. One of the options, maybe, um, you know, uh, what you said you know, was uh, methodological nationalism, um, but that also has some place. I mean, con trying to construct, and this is speaking as someone who believes that uh, values and you know legal systems can be constructed. Um, by with the participation of what we are getting from the West and what we're getting from uh, the local uh, systems that we have. But I just want to say that that's one of the options. So I'm not sold on any part, any specific, any particular or any combination of these uh, solutions as of yet. But I think all of these possible alternative approaches um, have a place, we need to talk about them uh, in depth. And one of the things I want to point out, um, maybe at the risk of being too critical, is uh, a number of the things the two of you said in, in the last you know, uh, train of comments is, for example, Awal, you said that you know, we being part of uh, the global economic order, um, and I don't remember how uh, Hela Gabriel used the word we also, you know, there's the sense of we. Um, and the question, the question I started with mm. earlier is actually, who are we? When we say we, are we talking about us, the uh, educated, maybe also moneyed elite of Ethiopia? Does that we include? So when you said, you know, being part of the global economy, Yes, it makes sense for us, the we, the elite, yes, right? But does that make sense for, let's say, a pastoralist in Ethiopia who by, you know, uh, going into those, uh, you know, investment contracts okay, uh, uh, might actually force out of his or her land, you know? So, okay, so when we're, yeah. So about it, I think, you know, if, if, if we contest everything, um, there is a risk that everything becomes everything at the same time. Um, no, I, I'm not trying to contest yeah. everything. I'm but, just but, saying... No, the point... Be... Yeah, no, I hear you. The point I was trying to make by we is because I'm talking about international treaty. And uh, as a lawyer, you know that only states can be parties to treaties. As individuals, as groups, we are subject to the jurisdiction of a state. So at least whether we like it or not, with all the problems around the question of the we as part of the body politic, we belong there, at least for the purpose of international. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm not saying we don't. You know, I'm just. So, this is yeah, no. And I think cautionary. Uh, uh, you know, a caution because 
um, when you said investments, treaties, and contracts, that re really reminded me of land grab, which is an extension of the globalization of, you know, the Ethiopian uh, polity. So, you know, when we, there is always a risk. When we talk about we, there's always a risk that uh, we could okay. exercise I, I, power. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to let you go in that direction because I, I, I don't see how the, that particular usage of we sort of fits in with the ways I use the we here. So if, well, we, if we go down that line, we'll end up in a different kind of conversation. And I, I understand that debate, by the way. I, I understand that debate, but here we are really interested in a more narrower idea of we, with all the contestations that sort of underpins that, that language, right? So if, if okay. we go down that route, I think we'll, we'll go off track. And that's why I wanted to sort of um, keep us um, uh, sort of close to our discussion. So I think from what you just said about it, what I understand is that at some level, we can acknowledge and we can recognize the iniquities and um, um, injustices that are built into the fabric of the existing system. But at the same time, there are opportunities in some cases to work from within this very system to sort of try and you know, critique it sometimes, disrupt it, expose it, try to change it. Because everything that speaks in the name of the universal, right, just as problematic as it is, it also opens up opportunities. Because it is telling me that I belong to this particular body politic. And once you, know, you, you spoke in the name of the we, I can always say, what about me? I also belong there. But in practice, I'm excluded in this way, and so on and so forth. Now, you know, it, it's not that straightforward. This is far more complicated in terms of uh, dealing with questions of structural racism and exclusion and so on and so forth. But, but there is something in terms of working from within the system. The other option is to completely reject the legitimacy of the existing system, right? And try to find an alternative way, as you said, of constructing um, a new sort of arrangement, right? Now, to what extent is that possible? Uh, how does something like that can uh, take off the ground given uh, the question of, uh, you know, who defines uh, everything um, around the world? So, so that's, I suppose, a lot more problematic. But can I just say one thing in terms of how for example, the, uh, the movement within various universities here in the UK is trying to tackle this problem. One of the things that they are doing is uh, to say that our curriculum, uh, our uh, degree curriculums are too wide. And one of the ways in which to decolonize this curriculum is to inject some writings into the reading materials um, written by non-Western uh, academics. So instead of simply having a reading list that is completely filled with sort of white, um, uh, middle-aged um, academic, uh, in some cases, um, old and dead academics, uh, we should have writings by African scholars, Indian, Asian, Middle Eastern, Latin American scholars as well. And that is one way in which uh, students think um, we can sort of move towards a more um, decolonized uh, education system where the views and ideas uh, of various um, cultures and societies are reflected. I think having said that we sort of try to problematize in some abstract way the sort of global um, problem around uh, the politics of who produces the knowledge we use and, and to what effect. Uh, can we zoom in now specifically on Ethiopian studies and whether what goes in the name of Ethiopian studies is Ethiopian enough? and um, focus on that uh, piece by uh, Hewan Simon uh, that sort of triggered a chain of responses by so many people uh, and run by uh, Addis Standard. Um, and, and, and you have both replied uh, to that piece and I don't want to reiterate the argument in the piece. Um, I have, I've reached out to her uh, to ask her if she could participate in this program. Uh, she uh, is unfortunately not able to take part in the program. Uh, but I have asked her a couple of questions in relation to the pieces that you two wrote, and she has sent me an answer, and I will read that because that's what she asked me to do. Um, if I could just start with you, uh, Haile Gabriel. What do you take to be the central problem in her thesis? 
Um, well, um, I have uh, stated in my article, uh, in my reply to her, uh, the main problem with this, uh, the the limited uh, engagement of uh, her critique with uh, the Eurocentricism of uh, Ethiopian studies. Well, what is Ethiopian studies again? That is, you know, uh, is something was for the past, you know, have assumed or uh, have not, you know, elaborated that. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, I think what we both think of, you know, as Ethiopian studies is that something or that scholarship or that knowledge system, uh, which is produced by the Institute of Ethiopian Studies and uh, overseas affiliates in different parts of the Western world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be defined by, at least uh, to, to this, to the purpose of this discussion, by what is, you know, uh, produced in the journals of journals of Ethiopian studies and uh, the different international proceedings uh, that are published by the Institute of uh, Ethiopian Studies. Now, that is, you know, what I consider to be, you know, uh, the field of Ethiopian studies. Uh, um, it, can, it can be conceived more broadly uh, or narrowly, uh, but that was what was in my mind when I responded to her article and uh, I stick to that understanding of Ethiopian studies. And uh, I was engaged or I have been engaged with, you know, with with that scholarship for a while now. And my uh, impression is that uh, what uh, my impression is, you know, this uh, Eurocentric view of the world is, you know, very much embedded in that scholarship and it's not something surprising and uh, it's, it's been, you know, uh, one of the issues which which has been raised by uh, the participants of, you know, that scholarship as well. And there is, you know, uh, uh, productions in that line as well, like like by way of critiquing the Eurocentricism of uh, that scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, but again. Uh, just like Hewan, that scholarship is, you know, very much limited or focused to critiquing what they consider to be the exclusion of, you know, Ethiopian, the unpacked Ethiopian, Ethiopian perspective uh, from that particular uh, scholarship or the dominance of, you know, Eurocentric views in that particular scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, um, my take on that is that, it, uh, well, uh, I agree with that thesis that Eurocentrism is a problem, you know, of Ethiopian studies. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, I don't think that that is, you know, uh, the only problem of, you know, that scholarship. Uh, the other problem of that scholarship, I would say, is, uh, is uh, nationalism. Is so entanglement with official nationalism, and yeah. So, so, so your view is that she does a very good job of diagnosing the mm -hmm. centric problems that are central to Ethiopian studies. But there are blind spots in terms of her broader approaches that Ethiopian yes. studies itself, if we are talking about the broader Ethiopia, does commit the same kinds of marginalizations and exclusions that Eurocentrism commits. And yes. what she's calling yeah. this yes. view is best described as methodological nationalism than mm. decolonizing Ethiopian studies. Is that 
Yeah, the, the methodological nationalism, I would say it's, uh, the, uh, well, I use the methodological nationalism metaphor to describe our approach to decolonizing that part of, you know, that, that scholarship, mm -hmm. like centering Ethiopia, centering Ethiopian scholars, uh, making it more Ethiopian, because mm -hmm. that was, you know, her concern. Yeah. But, but again, you know, uh, uh, I would say uh, it is, if, you know, seen from a different angle, it is more Ethiopian, you know, than Ethiopian in quotation, more uh, Ethiopian than me. So, so the concerns that, uh, that seem to have animated the piece mm -hmm. um, are not necessarily... Uh, um, Eurocentrism, but it's not necessarily. Let me put it this way: is not necessarily liberating Ethiopian studies from the hegemonic hold of Eurocentrism, but rather uh, a different way of giving voice and visibility to a very particular idea of Ethiopia, Ethiopianness, or what Ethiopian studies is exactly is about, right? Using Amharic and, and so on and so forth. Yep. Right. Um, Abadir, let me come to you. What, 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 in your view, is the central problem of uh, the piece by uh, Hiwan? Uh, we can't hear you. Um, okay, we can hear you now. Okay, so um, the thing is, I actually agreed a lot with her. I didn't, uh, so I, by the way, I, I agree with uh, what Haile Gabriel said in a general sense, uh, what he wrote about her, uh, but my, my problem wasn't that. My, uh, my first problem was that I was left unsatisfied. Um, unsatisfied with unsatisfied with so you know I agreed with the articulation of her problem the articulation that um, there is um, you know decolonization that needs to be done however when she goes farther the first problem that I couldn't get over is that she assumes that somehow um colonialism or coloniality in Ethiopian knowledge or in Ethiopian education is somehow a thing of the past. You know, it's, it's just about fixing the, who the participants in this uh, construction of knowledge are, and that is it. So it, that raised questions of, wait, are you saying that colonialism, you know, or neocolonialism, let's say, or, or let's say the you know you could you could articulate this in, in many ways or let's say the effects uh the after effects of colonialism are you saying it's done um and she doesn't address that earlier you the two of you were talking about the relationship between power and, and knowledge and does doesn't that still exist um and the reason the, the racism she talks about, the, the bias and prejudice she talks about, um, you know, in, in earlier forms of Ethiopian studies. Uh, yeah, that racism might not exist, but really is there a different and newer form of, you know, for example, in, in our field, uh, for example, we have uh, liberal versus illiberal democracies and illiberal societies you know, is that, is that maybe the new form of uh, colonial thought that, that is dominant in Ethiopia? So it, it left all those things unanswered. And that's why I said, you know, uh, colonialism in the rear view mirror, because maybe there's more going on in the power relations and power knowledge dynamic than just the language aspect of it. Um, so that's, that's the main... Um, um, the main thing I could not 
get over. And the second one is something that you've already alluded to, which is, um, you know, when we're talking about decolonization, the way she put it, I was left with the impression that decolonization necessarily will, not necessarily, but may or risks ending up in unequal and exploitative power relations that, you know, are animated by local dynamics. So, you know. Okay, so, um, so I, I did put this question uh, to her, particularly in terms of uh, uh, Haile Gabriel's claim that the, the kind of animating assumptions behind, uh, behind the piece, which sort of comes through very forcefully at, at different occasions, uh, different moments in the piece, um, and also the very visible uh, problem that uh, Haile Gabriel described as metrological nationalism. I put this question to her, and this is her response, and I, I will read it because that's uh, what she asked me to do. And she says, and I quote, if there are limitations to Ethiopian studies beyond Eurocentrism, then it is everyone's job to first accept that the studies has to be decolonized and then work towards an all-encompassing genre. I am a history student. If one looks back into Ethiopia's history, there isn't a single one of us today who can confidently boast the nature of Ethiopia's rulers and past to be anything. For us to go about attempting creating a complex, rigorous, and independent thinking Ethiopians, Ethiopians who have been trained in the Ethiopian studies field, we have to take first steps. For me, it's accepting that the field is not ours. Quote it in any sort of way you want. That first quote appears loaded, but it's quite simple to answer. It's a, it's a quote that I sent her uh, from your piece. Abyssinian centrism does not exist, she says. Abyssinian centrism. Say that last part again, sorry. Abyssinian centrism does not exist. If it does, it exists in people who use the term and phrase and aren't wholly educated about Ethiopia's history beyond the past hundred years. Mm. So, so basically, I think the concerns that you both raised, which has to do around the Abyssinian core of the Ethiopian states, not only in terms of what we call Ethiopian studies, but also uh, in, in a range of um, areas uh, when we talk about uh, Ethiopian identity, Ethiopian politics, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, her point is that that centrism, that core, uh, doesn't actually exist. Uh, it only exists in the minds of people who have only studied Ethiopia's history uh, up to um, you know, going back to the last 100 years. Beyond that? Mm. Uh, well, I beg to differ. Uh, uh, this, well, uh, I don't think we, we, we agree, we all agree on this because there are, you know, different interpretations of history. Mm -hmm. uh, and apart from that, uh, the way we talked about it, you know, is very much uh, attached to our sentiments because we are invested in it and we cannot, you know, uh, dissociate ourselves from the way uh, history is interpreted in a particular way. So uh, uh, I'm not seeking, you know, agreement on that. And uh, there are different ways of, you know, uh, approaching uh, the history or the modernity of the formation, the social formation, what we call, what what, what, call, what we today call Ethiopia. And uh, I stick with the interpretation of the likes of John Merkakis that this modern social formation in Ethiopia is Abyssinian at the core. And the very fact that this modern the state is Abyssinian at the core, and the formation is Abyssinian at the core, uh, can also be, you know, manifested uh, through the unfolding struggles that are, you know, uh, um, 
yeah, troubling the uh, stage right now. So it's, you know, a very uh, deeply uh, uh, entrenched problem, uh, the way we deal with it or the way we interpret history. And another point, uh, well, uh, even in her uh, initial piece, uh, she talks about, you know, the importance of resistance and the importance of resistance towards the Eurocentricism of uh, ACP studies. And she claims that there has not been, you know, resistance before. But I don't think that is the case because uh, the emergence of, you know, different studies, fields of specialization outside the European studies, for instance, or almost studies, is uh, an indication that there has resistance to, not only to the Eurocentrism of, you know, the field, but also, you know, mm -hmm. the Abyssinian centricism of uh, the field. So the resistance has already been there. And uh, this resistance, apart from, you know, the emergence of such fields as Oromo studies, uh, you can also look back at, you know, the way uh, the Marxist intellectuals of the 70s and the 60s critiqued uh, the late imperial Ethiopia uh, or the highly Slavic region and its social formation. That, to a certain extent, even though it's past, you know, in terms of your language or in terms of European, in terms of European language or Eurocentric discourse, again, that can be, that can also be, you know, considered as a resistance to uh, a certain construction of, you know, Ethiopian history or a certain construction of, you know, the way we study, uh, the way we approach, you know, uh, Ethiopian modernity uh, or uh, the way we approach the decolonization of, you know, the relationship between the periphery and the, the Ethiopian periphery and, you know, the center. So uh, my point is uh, the resistance has already been there and uh, the uh, Abyssinian centricism, uh, well, uh, you can differ on this and uh, stick to different traditions uh, of interpreting the Ethiopian history or the, its modernity. Uh, I stick to the tradition that interpret the modern social formation that is Ethiopia as being Abyssinian at the core. Mm. I, uh, I, I, I suppose uh, most people would agree with the view uh, that the Abyssinian core did serve as both the engine um, and, and also the origin of what we call Ethiopian studies, uh, studies today. Um, so, so she denies that. Um, um, that's her position. Uh, but one of the other points she makes is that insofar as we accept that the, the field needs to be decolonized in order to create a more inclusive genre of Ethiopian studies. It is our responsibility uh, to do everything we can uh, to bring in those important forms of uh, remembering uh, and experiencing and so on and so forth, historically, sociologically, um, into, uh, into Ethiopian studies. It's only when you have some kind of epistemic fiction, uh, then you can move towards uh, what some people describe as uh, uh, epistemic equilibrium. So there has to be a contest between forms of knowledge. Um, and, and that is one, one thing that she proposes, although she, she denies that there is such a thing as uh, the Abyssinian core. And Abadir used it uh, in your piece that we don't even need uh, what is called Ethiopian studies, at least to question the need for Ethiopian studies. <laughs> Why? Why not? So the reason I'm um, I'm saying that there is because, see, the way Ethiopian studies is defined in her piece, it's basically 
um, a European other studying Ethiopia. Say um, that again. The a, a European other studying Ethiopia. If you look at how she, you know, she starts with the history of Ethiopian studies, which she says, you know, started in the West, but then, you know, uh, Ethiopians started participating in it, um, so on and so forth. It looks like Ethiopian studies in, in her perspective, or not in her perspective, but the way she, uh, uh, you know, portrays Ethiopian studies, it is still an outsider and, and a European self looking into Ethiopia from the outside and studying Ethiopia. And in the article, although she assumes that that center of Ethiopian studies have, has shifted to Ethiopia, it, it doesn't, I, I wasn't convinced that in the way she described it, that the, the center of Ethiopian studies has, you know, the uh, move from the West to Ethiopia. And the part of the reason I'm saying that is because when she's talking about Ethiopian studies taking place in Ethiopian languages, when she's talking about, for, oh, a good example is, for example, um, she says Ethiopians, that part of the problem is that Ethiopian scholars have to engage in foreign languages because they would not get jobs if, you know, they didn't use French or English. And that's telling me, okay, so if the West is paying for Ethiopian studies, and, and but by, by the way, she doesn't address this. I don't know if the West is still paying for Ethiopian studies or Ethiopians are paying for Ethiopian studies. I don't know that yet. But if, as she implies, Ethiopian studies is being sponsored by the West, then Ethiopian uh, studies is still a Western endeavor. I think, I think on the factual point, she's correct. That it's still based in it is significantly uh, funded by um, foreign. Um, so if in, that's the case, then the question is, so what she's basically saying is, okay, you know, there's this foreign funded study of Ethiopia. There's someone standing outside of Ethiopia and studying Ethiopia. And what she's saying basically is they should let us participate in that study. That's why I say, okay, as Ethiopians, the quest, if the question is about Ethiopians going outside and studying Ethiopia from the outside, then it's not coming from us. We're just participating in someone else's project. That's why I'm questioning, do we need Ethiopian studies? If we do, we so should that, have that, Ethiopian studies. That, by the way, is not really the core of her argument. It's, it's, one of, it's just one of the many problems that she raises. And the point she exactly. makes yes. is that the Ethiopian studies in Germany and also the Ethiopian studies based in Addis Ababa, uh, which she described as the most important secular institution of Ethiopian epistemology. This is the one based in, in Sindiskilo. That too is mainly funded uh, by external actors. And it's true that a number of uh, institutes that study particular areas in Ethiopia are funded by foreign actors. Human rights institutes are funded yes. by foreign actors and institutes of federalism and so on and so forth, right? And, and the point is that to the extent that there is a funding uh, resource issue that is tied to external actors, that does create its own problem. And I think that's a valid point, no? Yes, I, I mean, um, so are you saying that she's problematizing that it's funded from outside? Because I, I, I didn't get that impression, but I do agree with the point. Yeah, I know that's the point she's, she, she, she is making. I, I do agree with the point. So my question is, you know, by the way, what's the problem with, um, what's the problem with the, the essentialism, the, you know, um, coming from, Ethiopian studies or African studies? Why did that problem exist in the first place? Why does Ethiopian studies, why did Ethiopian, why, why did Ethiopian studies get founded in the West? Why did African studies get founded in the West? Is it not uh, a, a combination of, um, you know, the early colonial interests in studying the other that, that was about to be, you know, conquered and, and uh, possessed, right? So, you know, Ethiopian studies comes from colonial. Um, it is funded by 
uh, you know, global business as it existed then. So if you're saying it's still being funded from there, then it's, you know, uh, basically a problem. So um, is, is there a new form of colonialism in it? I don't know, but, you know, that, that raises a big question. Yeah, I think as a, as a matter of you know, factual accuracy, um, we don't know the conditions under which, I personally don't know the condition under which uh, European studies, which is uh, being really? established. Um, but it may not necessarily have the kind of colonial nexus that, that, you, uh, that you suggested. It is possible that it may be, I don't know, established by Ethiopians. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the fact. Um, maybe by Ethiopians who were not allowed to do precisely that kind of work in Ethiopia, just like the Oromo Studies Association, for example, it was established outside Ethiopia by Oromos, precisely because Oromo Studies is not a welcome uh, field uh, of study and, and, and scholarship in Ethiopia. Hi, little bit, do you know what the facts are on this? You describe yourself no. as a consumer of Ethiopian studies? No, uh, well, I've been the consumer that, you know, uh, someone who tries to look at into, you know, the fundings and it's, uh, yeah, so, no. Right. And, and basically, basically, by the way, I'm, raising, I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm saying it's raises, um, her conversation raises the question and leaves it unsatisfied. And, and as someone who doesn't come from Ethiopian studies, it's bothersome to me that this is not, you know, answered. And th that's that's what um, that's at least the first point I was trying to point out. Okay, let me ask let me ask both of you a, a final uh, kind of question. Um, I, I also just want to state for uh, our audiences online that this this program was initially. Uh, uh, scheduled to be a conversation between four people. One of our guests uh, didn't make it to the program. And therefore, the substance and nature and the content of the, co the conversation slightly shifted. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, but we did reflect broadly on um, uh, the problems at the global level in terms of the global orders of knowledge and how they were in, proposed and imposed on particular societies and how that imposition is generating uh, what we described as a form of violent uh, uh, outcome or violent uh, effect. Uh, we zoomed in specifically on Ethiopia. We were discussing uh, the pieces uh, that were uh, published by Addison Standard um, in which uh, both Abadir and, and Hargiri uh, participated. Uh, we are now concluding our uh, conversation, and I just want to ask one last question, which is, if we agree that Ethiopian studies need to be decolonized, and the kinds of prescription that Hiwan makes in this piece is not one that can truly and, and properly decolonizes Ethiopian studies, what, in your view, counts as a proper form of decolonizing Ethiopian studies? Uh, well, uh, I do have, you know, some uh, set of, you know, uh, well, what I right now call, you know, my strategies of decolonization, not only, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ethiopian study, but also, you know, my specific area of engagement, which is Ethiopian law or legacy history, the way it is studied and uh, how we uh, distance ourselves with, from, you know, the Eurocentricism of, you know, uh, that part of scholarship, uh, particularly the way we study uh, our imported laws. Uh, uh, one would be, you know, again, you know, uh, coming back to my earlier point, acknowledging, you know, the entanglement of, you know, the different imperialities, uh, that you know uh, sustain or that that make possible the the knowledge we have or uh, our systems of you know discourse uh, that would be you know one uh, the moment we appreciate the entanglement uh, uh, we become you know conscious of 
uh, how imperialism can shape, you know, our systems of thoughts or knowledge and how that might impact on, you know, uh, uh, people on the ground. Uh, that That is, you know, one. Another, again, you know, uh, acknowledging or remaining, you know, conscious of, you know, the partiality and limitation of, you know, our language. Uh, this, this point has been made, you know, uh, not only by people who are concerned with decolonization of, you know, uh, African studies or Ethiopian studies or the different area studies in the peripheral parts of the world, but also, you know, as scholars who uh, critique modernity within uh, European thought systems. Um, another, trying to, uh, another point, trying to theorize, you know, our own experience. Uh, uh, this is not a call for rejection of, you know, the different resourceful, uh, theoretical uh, approach that are, you know, still uh, from the West, but uh, trying to complement, you know, their limitation with uh, with new new approaches or new theorizations of uh, uh, existence in peripheral parts of the world, which we used to approach with you know, theoretical insights from the West. Uh, that that point is, you know, uh, the one which is, you know, focused at by Hewan and uh, different independent scholars. And uh, another point or another strategy which I suggest is uh, trying to expand our range of, you know, uh, areas of uh, comparison because uh, Eurocentricism is, you know, usually manifested by the tendency to compare ourselves against, you know, uh, the West or historical unfoldings or social formations in the West. Uh, instead of, you know, obsessing ourselves with that kind of comparison, uh, complementing that part of, you know, comparison uh, with comparisons with different parts of the world, for instance, comparing Egyptian mm -hmm. social formations or stories with African formations of uh, comparable African formations or formations in different parts of the world, like those areas where a non-colonial type of imperialist formations were uh, visible, that would be, you know, another area of uh, uh, right, right. Course, so, and then finally, re reflexivity, yeah, always yeah. meaning reflexive. That would be, yeah. you know. Mm. No, absolutely. And I think in, in some ways, this is a very, uh, a very rigid, uh, resistant, very stubborn uh, field, but at the same time, one that contains a certain form of reflexivity. Uh, that provides opportunities for, for intervention and, 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 and maybe in some very narrow sense of uh, uh, reconfiguration. I suppose, so what, what you are saying, um, if I put it um, um, in one sentence, is that the point or the, the, uh, the agenda is not about reinventing the wheel, but it's about finding spaces for intervention to bring about some kind of progressive change where we can move from the kind of uh, unequal uh, relations, right, in the epistemic sphere to a more balanced and a more equal relations. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Abadri, what in your view would be the best way to decolonize Ethiopian studies if we have to have something called the European studies? Um, can you hear me, by the way? It looks like my connection is problematic again. Uh, we can, I, hear can, we can, we can hear you now. Well? We can hear you. Okay, well, so I don't think I can say much about decolonizing, you know, um, Ethiopian studies because 
um, I don't come from that field, although although I engage with the field, I don't come from the field. So I don't think I have any uh, thing prescriptive to say with regards to that. Maybe if we have this conversation within our field, maybe within the legal field, that might be something we might talk about another time. But what I would like to say um, is that I, I would like to comment on the uh, Abyssinian uh, centrism issue. You know, I was looking at, you know, in, in the response that I had for uh, Hewan and the uh, Addis Standard article, there are so many things that I left out. And one of the things was to, you know, to point out how she uses sentences and the assumptions behind those sentences. And one of the things I picked up to talk about today was her uh, sentence, which says, um, independence allowed Ethiopians to continue using their languages. And I was going to say how that is so insensitive to the Ethiopians, to most Ethiopians who would say, no, independence didn't allow them to continue using their languages. They had the ex ex their experiences of Ethiopian non-colonialism -colonial is actually very similar to uh, other, uh, other people's under colonialism. I was going to say that, but since she has clearly said um, Abyssinian centrism doesn't exist, that, that kind of resolves the problem of uh, uh, figuring out uh, the nuances of the conversation. And, and by the way, you, you don't exist uh, 100 years ago, and, and it doesn't exist in Ethiopian studies or hist historiography or something. Uh, down that line, that might not be problematic. Of course, Abyssinian Abyssinia centrism didn't didn't exist 200 years ago because Ethiopia was a different place. But the question is, does it exist now? The question is, um, and I, as I said, I can't make a detailed uh, analysis of Ethiopian studies. But from what I've read about Ethiopian studies, from what I've read about the critique of Ethiopian studies, it looks like Abyssinian centrism does exist. But then, you know. One of the things in Helen's article, one of the problems of Helen's article is it focuses very specifically on Ethiopian studies education without taking into consideration uh, the construction of knowledge, which although Ethiopian studies might be important for that, um, it takes in the context of other kinds of discourses and conversations, uh, you know, theater, television, uh, you know, uh, music industry, so on and so forth. So even if it were true that Abyssinia centrism doesn't exist in the specific field of Ethiopian history, which I don't think is true, um, I, I guess Helen would have to enlighten us on why she says that. Um, even if that weren't true, you know, we have a situation where Abyssinia centrism exists pretty much in every genre of uh, discourse or genre in which knowledge is constructed. So um, I feel like Hewan is clearly oblivious to power relations in Ethiopia outside of the colonial, you know, uh, Europe versus uh, Africa sense. Um, and, and I think maybe she uh, also, this is something that I pointed out in my piece, she it looks like she misses or she's ob oblivious to why why is colonialism wrong? You know, colonialism isn't wrong because it's done by Europeans. Colonialism is wrong because it involves exploitation of a people. It involves discrimination against the people. It involves unequal and unfair relations. And if you're not okay with these kinds of relations when it relates to uh, Europe, and you're okay with them when it relates to Ethiopia or Abyssinia or whatever else you want to call it, then there's a big ethical question that, you know, becomes an answer. You know, I'm, I can't really say yeah. um, much about this except the fact that her placing herself, her being oblivious to the pains of it, and, and I talked somewhat, not extensively, but I talked about the grievances, for example, in... in uh, um, in the local beginning. colonialism discourse, for example, mm -hmm. in Oromo studies, she has yeah. basically placed herself outside that conversation, and she's saying, "You're not welcome. Your discourse is not welcome." And there are, there, are, there yeah. are certainly 
um, a particular um, tradition, uh, political tradition or uh, academic tradition in Ethiopia that doesn't accept the language of uh, coloniality uh, as a framework for understanding and conceptualizing the relations between the various group of people uh, who, who lived in that country. Uh, for some, the very language, the vocabulary of colonialism automatically conjures that, that image. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much uh, relations between um, two black communities or, um, you know, ethnic communities or communities who even share the same language but have minor differences in terms of, uh, let's just say, you know, tribes and, and so on and so forth, that such uh, a relationship of marginalization, exclusion, domination can exist even within those relationships, right? Um, and she doesn't want to apply that language uh, to that particular form of relationship. And I think it's a problem that is that's very much common uh, within the Ethiopian state. Can I say something I will, in, in a minute about this? Because this, this is something that uh, cannot be left unsaid. Um, when we're talking about colonialism, when using the language of colonialism in Ethiopia, I have a big object objection to that uh, for one main reason. Not because it's inapplicable, but because... Um, you know, I see myself within a Pan-Africanist tradition where colonialism has a, a big role to play. You know, the idea of fighting colonialism, the idea of fighting apartheid has a big role to play. And um, the main reason I dislike the use of, you know, imperialism, yes, I like that analysis because it avoids my criticism. But the reason I don't like it is because when you're talking about colonialism from an African point of view, from a pan-African point of view, what you're basically saying is, you know, what, how you deal with colonialism is you defeat it and you kick it out. You know, within that, that's, that's, that's the ethos of anti-colonialism as I understand it. So, that's the implication. So when you have colonialism, how you deal with colonialism is you fight it, you, you know, um, cooperate in a Pan-African way and you kick it out. And that's what happened historically. That's what successfully happened in the anti-colonial movement. So when Ethiopians, when uh, uh, marginalized Ethiopians use colonialism as a concept, the, the, my biggest fear is that that's the implication that's the inevitable implication that it has and needs to be avoided. So, um, okay. You, so, yeah. Go so ahead. You you made an interesting point, but you also lost me in some profound way. I don't know if uh, uh, Gabriel is also lost as as I did, because what you were earlier saying is basically that the kind of relation that existed between the various groups that make up the Ethiopian state is one that is essentially and irreducibly colonial. And um, now you are saying that yes. you are uncomfortable with the use of that language to describe that reality. Well, see, if, and, if you and I are talking about uh, whether the concept of, I guess we we're talking about this live, so it's not a private conversation. If you, you, know, if you and I are talking about whether the concept of colonialism is applicable, I will agree that it is. It is applicable. You know, there is no reason it shouldn't be, it wouldn't be applicable. But what I'm saying is when we as Ethiopians talk about these things, we shouldn't use the word colonialism. We should articulate it in different terms. Imperialism is a good uh, word that Haile Gabriel used earlier. Um, because, you know, look at it from the perspective of uh, a hewa or let's say the, the Ethiopian, mainstream Ethiopian constituents. Why do I look at it from their perspective? I'm looking at it from their perspective because, you know, if, if you, for example, use apartheid or colonialism to describe uh, their pains, these, these descriptions are, pre are unavoidably prescriptive. 
you know, how you deal with colonialism is decisively. Versus in, in Ethiopia, I don't think that, um, I don't, I think we need to avoid that implication. How about the coloniality of power and the colonial formation of knowledge that we are talking about here? It's not just uh, a kind of uh, former political control and occupation but of native people by Europeans uh, who, uh, you know, used various forms of uh, uh, relations to inter countries and, and occupy land and describe it as terra nullius and use various uh, uh, positivistic jurisprudence to sort of establish colonial infrastructure and so on and so forth. So, yes, that is colonial proper. Yes. Um, but what we are really talking about here is more to do with the coloniality of power and the ways in which colonial power or um, uh, the ways in which imperial forms of power or colonial forms of power as well, they are not really very distinct. Uh, the ways in which those forms of power use or make use of knowledge in order to consolidate, sustain uh, themselves. Yes. Yes. So, um, so we have been using the language of coloniality and colonial decolonizing precisely to refer to this kind of phenomenon. Now, mm -hmm. when you shift it a little bit and say, it, I'm uncomfortable with the use of this language, I was like, what kind of discussion are let, we having? Let me, let me try to explain. Okay. If, if it's possible to explain this with the time we have, let me try, if at all. Um, so what I'm saying is, if we were sitting in the 1970s, so, oh, let me start with um, coloniality or colonialism and imperialism, you said, are the same thing. And I will say that they aren't. No, I didn't say they are the same. Could, I could agree with you. Not, you know, I didn't uh, say they are. I didn't say they are the same. Uh, but they draw on similar structures, similar yes. domains, in yes. terms of enunciating themselves, in terms of distributing themselves and setting uh, that discourse to operate and generate uh, outcomes that are productive yes. to the imperial powers or colonial powers. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, even, I'll take that qualification. So I will agree with you. I would have agreed with you, even if you said they're the same. How I want to qualify them is, is to say that imperialism as a phenomenon has existed throughout history and still exists. Now, the question is, Colonialism is a specific type of imperialism that came from Europe. So it's the same phenomenon, but we're using a specific word for that one. And what I'm saying is we shouldn't take that word that applies to European imperialism and apply it to imperialism within Ethiopia because of the consequences it has. But about the language, as a, a particular um, uh, field of study is being used uh, almost for the last, what, post-colonial studies, maybe about 30, 40 years, even more. It has been um, around for a very long period of time. By now, it's a thriving field. And this is the framework that is that's used not only to, to describe and, and explain uh, that kind of, um, you know, occupation of uh, native people by uh, Europeans, but also various forms of unequal relations uh, that exist in different parts of uh, uh, the world. Uh, I, okay. I want to come to you because we need to conclude. Okay, C can I say one thing before we go? To okay, I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds is good enough. Um, so what I would propose is I'm very comfortable um, with, let's say, you know, scholars in the 70s using the word colonialism to describe relationships inside Ethiopia because it has, it has a shocking, a provocative effect. And, and I actually welcome that because um, when someone says there's colonialism in Ethiopia, it has that provocation that will attract the attention of the, the, the someone who is oblivious 
to that unequal uh, relationship. So I support it in that sense. However, today, I think, um, given that the government of Ethiopia is actually, you know, uh, promoting the rights of nations and nationalities, the 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 discursive atmosphere we're in is one in which we don't really need to shock people. People are already understanding, you know, the <laughs> Abyssinia-centric nature of Ethiopia. So right now, I think it's less helpful than it is. <laughs> it's more harmful than it's useful, and we should easily phase out of that colonial, the, using that word and using the I, uh, and so forth. You know, as, as someone who have known you for, uh, I think, the last 10 or uh, maybe 10, 15 years, I wouldn't believe that you I accept the view, uh, the statement that you just said, which is uh, the Ethiopian government is promoting uh, ethnic identities and the rights and uh, um, uh, entitlements of various ethnic groups. Um, there is a kind of structure there, um, but uh, there's no commitment, as a matter of fact, in the Ethiopian state has always uh, sort of moved between uh, promoting uh, that form of politics and, um, you know, returning to a more former, uh, older form of uh, Ethiopian identity, depending on what is politically productive. Uh, to and the post-2005, post uh, between 2005-2010, you're probably right, yeah. Um, no, we, are, I, we are celebrating Ibandra Karmanam and so on now. And, uh, and we're also I, celebrating a Behar Behar So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's not unimportant. There, there's a huge se seismic shift in Ethiopian uh, government sponsored discourse. I, I, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I can see that point. But given how it is politically appropriated and used to sustain and, and, and consolidate the rule of a minority regime for such a long period of time and with such devastating effect, I think it would be problematic to describe this as sort of promoting uh, this, uh, this form of uh, uh, inter ethnic relations. Uh, but in any case, I think we can have uh, an extensive conversation on that as well. Uh, Gabriel, you have the last word. Uh, so, so if you have... And I, I did ask you uh, the question of how uh, best we can decolonize Ethiopian studies, and I've heard your views, but because we uh, we had a slightly longer conversation, I thought you might uh, want to jump in. Um, well, uh, um, responding to Abadr's um, point, earlier point, that, that you know, uh, importance in shying away from you know the use of the concept colonialism or coloniality in describing uh, different phenomena of you know uh, domination, exclusion, or uh, subjugation in Ethiopia, and sticking to the word or the concept imperialism, uh, I wouldn't see that much difference between you know the use of the concept imperialism or imperiality. Uh, and days of, you know, the concept of coloniality because relationships, well, uh, in some sense, uh, the, the difference between, you know, uh, imperial forms of, you know, domination and colonial forms of domination can be very thin one. And, uh, yeah, I, I understand, you know, the very uh, um, sensitive nature of, you know, the use of uh, colonialism. But again, you know, uh, diagnosing, you know, uh, for using, you know, the, the, the concept for the diagnosis of, you know, a certain uh, unequal relationship between, you know, the state and you know the different peripheral subjects just in Ethiopia or anywhere else with the use of the concept of colonialism or coloniality mm -hmm. uh, i don't see any uh, problem with that yeah and i think at some point this is precisely where knowledge actually meets politics in a very visible form uh, you yes. appropriate a particular kind of framework because it generates a particular kind of sometimes had a shocking effect or uh, uh, mm -hmm. registers in a very particular way. Um, but uh, um, 
I, I thought that was a, a really interesting discussion, uh, but at the same time, very complex discussion, um, and especially uh, moving from the global to the local and the kind of uh, different manifestations that this constellations have at the, at the global level and at the local level. And the very, I think, complexity and contingency uh, underneath some of the list, this languages that we use, coloniality, imperialism, and so on and so forth. And they do a better job of, I think, uh, articulating uh, some of the problems in certain areas and um, in other areas, other languages, other frameworks do a better job. Um, I want to thank both of you, uh, Abadir, uh, Dr. Abadir from Chicago, Helga uh, here from Melbourne, uh, for taking your time to join me on this program. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank our uh, viewers who are following us uh, live um, until we uh, get back together in uh, another program, hopefully uh, this week. Uh, goodbye. Thank you.